Welcome to everyone who is joining us today for this webinar. And first, happy International Women's Day for women participating in this webinar. And I uh, would like to thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Jose Belen, as I already introduced me, and I'm a translator and at Albert Einstein Research and Education Institute and MS candidate in academic writing at the University of Sao Paulo. And we are so exciting to have Professor Barbara Gesto join us today to present the talk editing your own work, help yourself to communicate successfully. Uh, and this talk is part of a webinar series um, about academic writing, scientific communication and publication organized by the Translation Editing and Writing Service of the Library System at the Albert Einstein Education and Research Institute. And this webinar uh, series will occur throughout the year. And so we're starting today and with Dr. Gisto and I may, uh, and in May we have section on a dynamic reading strategies for health works by Diana Asintimbe from University of California, San Diego. And in August, other session on structure and language features of medical papers by Jamila Bart from Georgia State University. Um, and in the second semester of the year, we will doing a session on how to communicate with reviewers and editors by Dr. Susan Aiello, who is the former editor of the Merck, Merck Veterinary Manual. And last uh, but not least, in November, we will have a session on the importance of feedback in the writing process by Professor Marília Mendes Ferreira from University of São Paulo. You all can register and for this and others free webinars and training at our library website at www.istein.br slash Encino slash Biblioteca. To learn more about our activities, uh, so you can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook at Sebi Biblioteca. Um, so oh, just uh, before uh, I int we introduce our speaker, uh, I would like to, um, to make few housekeeping announcements. Um, and after the presentation, uh, Dr. Gisto will be available for questions and answers. And to ask a questions, use the questions and answer function at the bottom of your screen. And also feel free to submit questions during the webinar, not necessarily after it. And for those require a certificate of attendance, please feel free, um, feel, sorry, fill out the attendance list that will be made available in the chat box. And please complete the satisfaction evaluation survey that will be also uh, put it down in the chat box prior to the end of the session. And now to Dr. Gaisto. Um, Dr. Gaisto, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read your full bibliography, but all participants can access uh, Dr. Gaisto's full bibli bibliography in the link provided in the webinar uh, invitation. And we also put it down in the chat box so you can access. Uh, Dr. Gisto is a physician specialized in biomedical writing um, and editing. She's professor of integrative bioscience, humanities in medicine and biotechnology at Texas A&M University, where she coordinates the master degree program in science and technology journalism. Dr. Gisto earned earned a BA from Yale and MD and a MPH from John Hopkins. After medical school, 
Uh, she did an American Association uh, for the Advance of Science Mass Media Fellowship at Newsweek. She then worked in communication and administration of the National Institute of Health, NIH. She also has taught science writing at MIT. Dr. Giesel is the lead author of the current edition, How to Write and Publish a Scientific Paper. She also uh, published other books, articles, and book chapters on writing, editing, teaching, and medical topics. Dr. Giesel has received an award from the Council of Science Editors, and she is fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Giesel, thank you again for joining us today, and take it away. You're muted, Dr. Gisto. Okay, let me share my screen just a second. And um, let, let me bring that up as soon as the um, the controls allow me to do that. Just a second. Let's see, the um, controls were doing some funny things. So let me do, do a new, new, new share. And let's let let me see now it has um, disappeared let let me go go exit a little bit because um what happened is i was it was saying that you were still sharing but now you're no longer sharing so i should be able to to do that now without any difficulty just just a second while it while it comes up again thanks for your your um your patience and then we'll we will be able to get going and you may be able to edit edit this edit this out so now it it should be coming up okay now and let me maximize after the um the other things are not not blocking it off just a second yes because the um the yeah, I think it's panel was now blocking it's working. it off. So let me. I moved the control panel, so I should be able to maximize it now. So now it should be maximized, and everything, and everybody should be able to see. So thank you, thank you for your patience. And it is. I am very, very happy to be here and to have have you join me. It looks like you have put together a wonderful series of speakers and i'm really honored to be first in this in this series um, today i will i realize that most people who are listening may not be native speakers of english and so i will try to speak slowly and clearly if i forget and start talking too fast let me know and ask me ask me to slow slow down so today we're going to be talking about editing your own work, um, helping yourself to communicate successfully. And first of all, want to say welcome. I'm so glad to have you here. I wish we could be meeting in person, but I think this is second best. And this is a picture on the campus at my university taken about this time last year. It's getting to be wildflower season and they're very pretty uh, wildflowers here in Texas. So an overview, and let me mention, I have shared these slides. So if you'd like to use them, you can ask um, Joseph for them. And also I'm pleased that this is being recorded. So first of all, um, talking about um, Reason, we'll talk about why to edit your own work, then getting enough distance to judge your work objectively, some general things to check for, 
some checklists for editing papers and proposals, and that will be a large part of this presentation. Some common problems to remedy. Some tips specifically for non-native users of English. And then finally, some resources. And after that, we will open things up for questions and answers. So why edit your own work? Why bother? There are a number of reasons, I think. One is simply your work is more likely to be accepted if it is well edited, if it's in good form. So if you send it to a journal, it's more likely to be accepted. Or if it is a grant proposal and it is well written and well edited, it is more likely to be accepted. And it can increase your likelihood in a number of ways. Editing it, you can make sure you um, have met um, the criteria for content and style that you have fulfilled all the requirements. Also, if something is well edited, people are more likely to understand it correctly. So they're unlikely to reject it because they misunderstood what you were trying to say. And also a well edited document creates a good impression and therefore aids acceptance. Um, most important, and so I put it in bold face, um, a w editing helps ha in communicating with readers because main purpose of editing is to make sure everything is, is clear. And so it helps communication. It also can minimize editing by others. So let's say you send in a paper and it still is not well written and needs editing and the journal accepts it and somebody there edits it. Well, if they edit it, maybe they will, you know, change some of the meaning or something. But if you edit it yourself, it's unlikely to be, be distorted by others editing. And there can be other reasons as well, but I think these are the main ones. And so let me just check, check now and, and make, make sure, is this coming through clearly? And am I going at about the right pace? I don't have any comments here, but... Um... People say yes, yes, uh, yes. I think you're in a very, it's okay. People say, oh. Alexandre. I think people are, yes. Okay, good. Most of the people are, are agreeing. <laughs> okay, good. So I'll continue about, about the same. And perhaps, Jose, maybe you can be monitoring the chat. And so if, you know, if anybody's having a difficulty or if they find I'm starting to go too fast, let let me know. Okay, absolutely. So let me move on to our next slide. One of the things I want to emphasize is what's most important in writing. One thing the most important is the content. Because if writing doesn't have good content, no matter how beautifully written it is, it's not a good piece of work. Organization is really, really important too. And clarity, very important that it be clear. Those are the things that really are needed. And um, in editing your work, checking these items is more important than polishing the language. Polishing the language is important too, but these three things are most important because if something has good content and is well organized and is clear, people will still understand it or, or and a professional editor can edit it well. But if these things are missing, then um, really um, there's a problem. So important to focus on content, organization, and clarity and, and then polish the language as well. One difficulty sometimes in editing your own work is getting enough 
distance. In other words, you may be so familiar with your work. You may know your work so well that you really can't judge it. You can't tell if it's clear. You can't be objective. So what can you do to get more distance? Here are a few suggestions. One is to set the draft aside for a while, to write it, and maybe come back to it the next day or in a few days. Then you can have a fresh view and judge it more objectively. Another thing is to print out the draft. I think a lot of us are used to working on screen almost all the time. But if you um, print out the draft, you can get a fresh view. Um, you can look at it with new eyes. Also, this helps in noticing the macro level aspects, the big scale aspects. So maybe I'm just looking at something on my laptop screen and I don't notice that I had 10 paragraphs in a row that began with the same word which looks really weird in print. If I print it out, I notice that and I can vary things more. Another thing that can help in getting a fresh view is even to change the look of the draft. You can change the typeface, font. You can increase the margins. You can print a draft on colored paper. All those things can help get a fresh view. And I think maybe the most useful or one of the most useful is just to read the draft aloud. Because again, if you read it aloud, I think it's easier to notice, let's say if you've repeated things or if something is kind of clumsy and hard to read. So I hope some of these suggestions are useful. Also, there's sort of, you have some choices as to how to approach the editing, so what order to do things in. Um, one way is to edit from beginning to end, let's say for a scientific paper. Another is to look at the tables and figures first and improve them first and then do the text. And another way that some people do it is to edit the references first and do the rest. And there's no one right way. You can do it whatever way works. Also, in terms of scale, one way is to start with the macro aspects, for example, the overall organization and content, and then move to the micro aspects, for example, the wording and the punctuation. Another is the opposite, to start with the micro aspects and then move to the macro. And the other is sort of to alternate. And that's, that's what I usually do. I think in editing my work, I first look at sort of the big picture, try to deal with big picture issues. And then I move to things like polishing the wording. But then often at that point, I notice some other macro problems and I come back and solve them. And then I go back to micro. So for me, sort of alternating works well. But I think there's, again, no one right way. Whatever works for you is what to do. And I think one thing to remember is that editing is an iterative process, a repetitive process. And so usually it's not enough to edit things once. Usually to do a good job of editing your own work, you need to go through at least twice, sometimes three times or more. So some more Texas wildflowers. And first of all, let's consider some general things to check for. And these could be things that you would check for in almost any kind of document that you're editing. So first of all, some things to check for with regard to the crafting, with regard to the writing. One is, are the ideas presented in a logical order? Is there good logical organization? Another thing is, are there clear transitions from idea to idea? Um, 
does it flow from one idea to another so that readers know the relationship of the ideas? Another thing that's helpful is our overviews presented before details. Very often is helpful to readers if you sort of summarize your main point before presenting details. And I think sometimes authors are so familiar with their own work that they forget to do this. Are the paragraphs an appropriate length? Are they a good length for the kind of thing you are writing? Because this, this can vary. For example, if you are writing a newspaper article, probably the paragraph should be very short. If it's a journal article, it would be longer. And so looking, are they a good length of paragraphs? You know, not too short, but not so long that it's really hard for people to read. Um, do the paragraphs have strong topic sentences? So in other words, normally in, let's say, a grant proposal or a journal article, each paragraph will begin with a sentence that sort of summarizes it or introduces the subject. So are there good topic sentences? Are sentences an appropriate length? And I think this is a big one for a lot of us. I know that when I do my rough drafts, often my sentences are too long and too hard to follow. They're very long and have parentheses within parentheses within parentheses. And then I, I need to go back and say, wait a minute, I need to say one thing at a time and have each main idea be a separate sentence. And so I will go back and revise accordingly. And then I'm checking, are, you know, is the grammar correct? Is the spelling correct? Punctuation, are words used correctly? So checking all those things. And as you'll see, I didn't put this first. I know a lot of people, when they think of editing their work, they think mainly of things like grammar and spelling and punctuation. And they're really important, but they're not the most important thing. So I put them somewhat later. Another thing to check for are the antecedents of all pronouns clear. In other words, is it clear what each pronoun refers to? I know there are some authors I work with and they'll often use the word it, but to a reader, the reader doesn't know what it refers to. So making sure it, if there's a pronoun, that the antecedent is clear or that you change the pronoun to an appropriate noun. And are appropriate verb tenses used? I know that can be a challenge, but making checking the verb tenses, for example, in a scientific paper, in the methods section, normally it's past tense and same thing in the results section. And also, if there's, let's say, a bibliography, um, our citations and references in the required formats. And then there are some other aspects to check as well. Um, one is, do the content and technical level suit the audience? Is this appropriate for your readers? Because maybe, let's say you've done some research and if you're writing it, let's say for a general medical journal, you might write it in one way. If you're writing it in a subspecialty journal in a specific area of medicine, it might be written in a different way. Um, is all the reasoning correct and clear? So is everything, again, is everything logical? And will readers be able to follow the reasoning? Um, is the information consistent throughout? Is the same thing said? I've sometimes, let's say, maybe you redo a calculation and you remember to correct it in the table, but not in the text. So is everything consistent and correct throughout? Are all the tables and figures necessary? Sometimes there are extra tables and figures and it's best not to have them. 
Or the flip side, should any tables or figures be added? Maybe as you read through, you think, wow, this, this point would be much clearer if I had a table or figure. And so should you add something like that? Um, everything that you've cited, did you remember to put it in the reference list? Similarly, when you have your reference list, is everything cited in the text? Did you remember to cite it? A more general question is just, are you comfortable with everything in the piece of writing? Or is there something that maybe makes you feel kind of uneasy that you think you really need to maybe check more carefully or um, organize better? And so is there anything more you should attend to? Another thing is if a checklist was provided, did you use it? One thing I really like is that some journals have a checklist of things authors should do before um, submitting their manuscript. And so if there was, did you use it? And um, did you do everything the checklist said to do? And finally, just have all instructions been followed? I know in my summer course, which Joseph has taken, one of the things I really emphasize is if you're writing for a journal, get the instructions to authors and follow them carefully. You know, read them before you draft your manuscript, um, consult them while you're working on it, and then look at them one final time before you submit the paper. Because at least I find very often there is at least one thing that I have forgotten to do. So checking, checking the instructions as well. So these were some things that um, apply, <laughs> excuse me, to almost anything you would write. But now let's look more carefully at editing papers and proposals and I'm providing some checklists that I hope you will be able to use in the future. And in a way, the, this will be a quick overview of how to write a paper, how, how to write a proposal. So first of all, a checklist for scientific papers. And this goes almost sort of from beginning to end. So first of all, checking, um, does the title accurately reflect the content? And does it concisely reflect the content? In other words, is it short, short enough? And what I like to do is in editing of my own work, I like to usually review the title at least um, twice, once before I edit the rest of the paper, and then again at the end, because in editing the rest of the paper, sometimes I get new ideas and about how to improve the title. And since the title is something that people read so much and decide whether to read the rest based on it, I think if you're not editing anything else, edit, edit the title. Another thing to check is are the appropriate people listed as authors? In other words, is everybody who's listed, does everybody qualify to be an author? And on the flip side, have you left out anybody who should be an author? This is a good time to double check. Does the introduction provide enough context? The introduction should provide um, enough background for people. Does, is there enough background there? And on the other hand, making sure there's the introduction does not go too long. Another thing about the introduction question to ask yourself is, does the introduction show what gap the research is to fill? And the, your research should be um, answering an unanswered question or filling a research gap. And it should be clear to readers by the end of the introduction, you know, what was missing from previous research and that you are trying to fill in. Another thing about the introduction um, that's related to this, normally, um, 
research should either have one or more hypotheses or one or more research questions or one or more objectives or a mix of these. And will it be clear to readers what, what these are? And some, sometimes they can be stated directly, like our hypothesis was, something like that. Other times it's stated more implicitly, sort of by saying, in order to determine whether such and such. So are all those things clear? And something that's not on the checklist, but I think I'll mention is checking whether the introduction is well-structured. And usually a well-structured um, introduction will start with broad background and then narrow down to the current research. And along the way, um, cite other relevant papers. So onward to the method section, some things to check. Does the method section provide enough information so that other people could replicate the research? In other words, so they could repeat the research or so they could use the same method in similar research of their own. And also, does the method section provide enough information to evaluate the research? So readers can see, is this sound research um, can it really answer the question? And a related thing, particularly if it's a clinical paper, would be, is there enough information so that readers can know how widely applicable um, the research would be? For example, to what group of patients the findings could be generalized? And similarly, if there are the sources of chemicals or equipment or, or animals, have they been identified? So moving forward in the scientific papers, a really important thing, I think, especially um, for a, um, an international journal, is if humans or animals were studies, our approvals noted, um, the, the journals I'm aware of, unless, for example, um, a, an institutional review board has approved um, human research, the, pay, the journal won't even consider publishing it. So make sure, of course, that there are approvals and that the approvals are mentioned. And Usually, they would be mentioned in the methods section. In the results section, are the results presented in a logical order? Is, does the order of presentation make sense? And in some cases, it makes more sense to, for example, begin with the most important results and then the other results. In other cases, a chronological order makes more sense, starting with the first thing that happened and then the second and the third. In some fields, there is a conventional order. There is a standard order, and one would follow a standard order. So making sure the results section, in other words, is well organized. Are the results presented in appropriate detail? Is there enough detail, but not too much? I mean, there needs to be enough detail for people to understand, appreciate the findings, but normally it should not be like a laboratory notebook with lots and lots and lots of individual pieces of data. So are, you know, have you been appropriately um, selective while while being objective and fair. I mean, in some cases, for example, rather than individual data, you may be able to indicate, let's say, um, mean and standard deviation or interquartile range. So appropriate, appropriate detail. And speaking of such things, were the appropriate statistical methods used checking? Because if the wrong statistical methods were used, the result may be misleading. Something that um, was significant may seem insignificant or vice versa or 
um, or you know a, a number may be off. So check checking the statistics. Onward um, to the discussion is some of the things to consider is remember um, we talked about the introduction should identify research questions or hypotheses or objectives. And so the discussion should address them. So if the, um, the research question is, you know, is this drug um, better than that drug for this disease, then the discussion should say, um, yes, it's better. No, it's not better. Or our re from our results, we still don't know, but it should address it. It, it shouldn't um, just sort of talk around it and never, never address the real question. And I find that that's a common problem that the question is never really answered. And I know some people suggest that early in the discussion, the question be addressed. Does the discussion put the results in enough context? Does it show how the results fit into the big picture? So this is, for example, where you would say how your results relate to other previous findings. And to me, this is one of the things that really makes the difference between maybe a sort of beginning student paper and the paper of a advanced student or a mature researcher um, that that you know the latter can really put the results in context and show how they fit in and what they really mean. Um, if appropriate, does the discussion address strengths and limitations of the research? Often this can be very valuable to do as well. And in terms of acknowledgments, are the appropriate people acknowledged? Um, I guess too, something relevant here is if someone edited your paper, um, it is considered um, the right thing to do to um, mention that and thank the person, both because it's polite and also in terms of transparency so that readers and editors know what in, went into the paper. So if people have provided help in any of a variety of ways, are they acknowledged? And does the abstract accurately summarize the paper? And you've noticed I've put this question um, at or near the end instead of at the beginning, even though the abstract goes very near the beginning of the paper. And I purposely put that here because I think until you've sort of evaluated and improved the rest of the paper, you can't really do that with the abstract because the abstract has to reflect the rest of the paper. And so that was a quick rundown of, of a checklist for um, scientific papers. Why don't we take a moment or two to breathe and then we will proceed to a um, similar checklist for grant proposals. And some of these are pretty similar to the list for the scientific paper. So first of all, um, are the um, goals and research questions or hypotheses clear? That obviously is really important in a grant proposal to make sure um, these items are clear. Another thing is the originality of the work apparent. Reviewers will want to make sure that this work is something that's really new, that it isn't just, let's say, a repetition of some previous research with maybe just a little change. So has it been made clear what is, what is new, what is novel about this work? Is the work clearly relevant to the funding sources mission? 
different sources of funding want to support different kinds of research, um, whether it be a government agency may have certain goals or a private foundation. And if it might not be clear um, how your work would be relevant, I'm checking whether it has been made clear. Um, here, an example might be this. Maybe you're applying, let's say, to a private foundation that is concerned with um, a certain disease. And you're, you're proposing to do some basic science research. Well, maybe the people reviewing the proposal might not know how this basic science relates to the disease and so need to explain it and emphasize that, you know, how, how this would help in understanding and treating the disease. Is the importance of the proposed work explained? Again, if it might not be clear why this work is important, explaining, you know, why, why this work is needed. Is enough context provided? Again, have you shown how this work would fit in? And this is usually done by providing a good, good literature review. Is the amount of proposed work realistic? I think many researchers, especially beginning researchers, but also more advanced people like me, try, you know, are too optimistic and are unrealistic, and they think they can do more than they can really do. And in reality, one can't be sure that everything will go smoothly and will go quickly. Um, and so it's better sometimes not to propose to do quite as much work, but be, be confident that you really can complete it. And I know grant reviewers, when they see that someone has proposed too much, they, um, they do not um, think highly of it. So better to make sure the amount of work can really be done. And also, are the people capable of doing the proposed work? Probably in the proposal, you will be saying who the research team will be and providing um, biographies or biosketches or curricula vitae of the people. And these materials should make clear that people have the needed background to to do this work. Are sufficient justifications provided for choices? So sometimes, for example, there might be, let's say two techniques that you could use for something. And let's say you choose to use one of the techniques. Have you explained why you are using that technique? Is enough supporting evidence inclu included? So sometimes, for example, you need results of preliminary studies or information from previous research to support what you have chosen to do. And um, also, also um, excuse me, um, are is sufficient um, justification um, provided um, for um, just a second um, for your budgetary items? So, um, important, you know, an important part of a proposal usually is the budget, um, how much money you're going to spend for things, and it should be written in such a way that it is clear to the reviewers um, why, why you are including things in your, your budget. If there will be cost sharing. So sometimes, for example, for a project, the funding agency wants, let's say, your hospital or your university to pay part of the course. So if there's going to be this kind of cost sharing, is um, enough 
information provided about it. Um, if um, if um, there should be preliminary studies before you do apply for the grant, you know, have you done them? And is there enough information about you know how you did them and what the results were? Just a second. Um, Often in a proposal, it's really helpful to have a timeline showing when you will do each thing. And that can make your plan clear and can help show your reviewers that it's realistic um, for you to actually do this. So, you know, if it might be good to have a timeline or something similar, have you included one? Um, how about tables or figures? Often tables or figures um, can help a grant proposal, but on the other hand, there shouldn't be too many. So should any tables or figures be added or deleted? For some kinds of projects, evaluation is needed. And if there should be evaluation plans, are they sufficient? And this can be especially important, for example, if you have a proposal for a service program or a teaching program, and the funding agency will want to know, well, how is, how, how is this project going to be evaluated? Similarly, some kinds of projects should have dissemination plans. For example, plans for publishing the results of the research or publicizing them at conferences, or putting them on a website. And so if you should have such plans, have you included them and are, are they good? And then um, again, sort of circling back to the title, does the title of the proposal clearly and accurately reflect the content? And again, if there is an abstract or the equivalent, let's say a specific aim section, is it informative and clear? And again, does it match the rest of the proposal? But abstract or specific aim section is especially important because uh, often the readers and reviewers really focus on, on that and use that a lot. And then just finally, is the proposal persuasive? in all regards, you know, is everything about it persuasive or is there anything you think is kind of weak and might um, make reviewers question whether this is a good proposal? And if there is anything that you think is weak, can you go back and, and improve it? So I think I am going to just um, catch my breath here for a second. And let me just um, check with our moderator. Um, everyone, everyone's still with me. Yes, Dr. Gisto, we're still uh, with most of the participants here. And <laughs> some of people are even interacting here in the chat, saying okay. yes, yes, we are. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. So now we will move into our um, last session, which is more about common problems and resources. And then after that, we will open it up for, uh, for open discussion. So thank you. I will proceed now to, to the um, to our next slide. Dr. Gisto? Yes. I think someone just raised a hand. Uh, would you mind to uh, um, listen her comment? I'd, I'd be pleased to hear her comment. Would okay, just a minute. Okay, Diane, can you go ahead? Let's see, I don't think I can hear the person. Is the person muted? Yes, just a second. I'm trying to see if I can. 
can activate here here in just a minute. Sure, yeah. take your time. I'm sorry, I have no question. Did I raise my hand? I'm Diane. Yes, Diane. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I think it's. I think it's very clear and lovely. So. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Then I will continue. Thank you. And a suggestion is to customize these checklists for your own use. So use these checklists as a starting point, but you might want to add some things and delete some things, change some things. So come up with a version that, that you find convenient to use. So now some, some of the things that I think are common problems to be alert for and remedy if they occur. So one is simply disregard of instructions. Sometimes people don't pay attention to instructions. So I know for journal editors, they are so happy if someone just follows the instructions and it's a, a good positive way to start. So check the instructions. Another common problem is not following good models. Often, if you can just find a good example of something, it can help show you how to do it. So let's say you're writing a case report for a journal. Look at a few other case reports in the same journal, and it can give you an idea of, for example, how, how long it should be, how it should be structured, what's, what's appropriate for that journal. Another problem sometimes is lack of focus. So check for, for focus. Another is excessive redundancies. In other words, repeating things too many times. I mean, sometimes it's okay to repeat things maybe once or twice for emphasis or in different parts of a paper, but sometimes things are too repetitive and need to take out some of this. Another problem is sometimes not making the reasoning clear because maybe the reasoning is clear to you, but it wouldn't be clear to readers, so need to spell it out. Another problem sometimes is poor parallelism. Let's say in a list, everything should be in the same um, grammatical form. And if it's not, it should be remedied. To take a very simple um, um, example of poor parallelism, um, let's say if someone um, says, I, I enjoy, um, let's say, um, reading, cooking, and to run. That in you know, parallelism off, they, they should say, I enjoy reading, cooking, and running. So keeping things in the same form. Excessive jargon, in other words, words that are more technical than needed, or even let's say laboratory slang. There are you know, some of the specialized terms that you might use in the laboratory, but they're really not proper wording. Or pompous wording. In other words, using words that maybe are bigger and more formal than are needed and maybe make people think they're being sound educated, but actually that make things harder to read. Or wordiness. I find a lot of times my, my drafts are too wordy, too long, and I can condense them. And I think this is sometimes particularly a problem in abstracts because in an abstract, you might have only 250 words and you still want all the content, but you can take out the extra words and we'll have a little exercise in that regard. Another um, problem sometimes is excessive use of acronyms or abbreviations, especially ones that you make up. I mean, it's fine to use standard abbreviations, DNA, ATP, AIDS, those kinds of things, but it's confusing if you make up a lot of new ones and it's not worth the space saved. Or another thing is undefined acronyms, using an acronym, but not defining what it stands for when you first use it. 
And as we mentioned, a problem sometimes is song, uh, sentences that are too too long and too too complex and convoluted and so hard to follow. So maybe you can join along with me and we'll, we'll practice condensing some wording. And again, I would say when you do your first draft, don't worry about if it's wordy, just get your ideas down. But then when you edit, try to make it more concise. So instead of saying absolutely essential, you could say essential instead of an adequate amount of. Enough, instead of are of the same opinion, agree, at the present time, now, consensus of opinion, consensus, despite the fact that, although, fellow colleague, colleague, has the potential to, and in an efficient manner, efficiently, in most instances, usually, in the event that, if, just two, two letters, is similar to, resembles, the majority of, most, on a daily basis, daily, take into consideration, consider whether or not to, whether to, was of the opinion that, believed. And if you say needless to say, well, then don't say it. So these are a few examples, and there are more examples in some of the resources that I will mention later. A few tips um, specifically for non-native English users. I think, again, going back to the beginning, remember content, clarity, and organization are key. I think sometimes people worry so much about grammar that they forget about the other things and certainly pay attention to the grammar, but, but um, don't worry. And if there are some, you know, a few grammatical problems, they are not, they will not lead to um, rejection. Another thing that can be really helpful is to prepare your own glossary or dictionary of common English language terms and phrases in your research field. I know I had someone I taught many years ago in China, and I was really surprised because his spoken English was not very good. But when he turned in his paper, the word choice was so excellent. And I asked him how he did it. And he said what he did is he got the, what he thought were the 10 best scientific papers in his research area. And he went through and took out words and phrases that applied to his research and used them. And he kept using this list. And since he was only using words and phrases, not whole sentences or paragraphs, it wasn't plagiarism. It, and it, it was very effective for him. Um, be alert for some aspects of English that may pose problems. For example, verb tenses or prepositions or articles often are difficult. And I know some authors who will go through their paper one time just checking verb tenses or prepositions things. Also, I think be aware of English language norms for sentence structure and length. I know that in Portuguese, um, sometimes sentences tend to be, I think, a bit longer than in English, or sometimes the word order tends to be somewhat different. So sometimes um, being aware of structure and length of sentences. Another thing that I am not sure if it applies in Brazil, but applies in some countries, um, and some languages, the writing in English, particularly about science, tends to be pretty direct. In some other languages, people tend to talk around the point more. And so sometimes in revising the work, you need to make it a little more direct. I think taking special care to avoid plagiarism, because sometimes in writing in a foreign language, sometimes if you see a paragraph or something that you think looks really great, there can be the temptation to just use it, but clearly shouldn't do it. And if you're, let's say, using a sentence or something, you need to quote and cite, cite it. 
And another thing sometimes is to check spacing because sometimes in different languages, spacing can be a little different. So these may be some things that um, could, could be relevant to consider. And so some now some resources um, at if I were um, giving this workshop in person, maybe at this point, I would also um, serve some cookies or cakes, something like that. We'd have some refreshments. And unfortunately, since this is by Zoom, Zoom is great, but you can't transmit um, cookies that way. So we will go on. So let me mention some of my favorite resources for writing and for editing. Um, one of them is um, onelook.com. Some of you may be familiar with it. This is an English language resource that lets you look things up in multiple dictionaries at once. And I find this is really helpful because sometimes a definition is not entirely clear from um, looking at just one one dictionary, but looking at several, it becomes clear. And also some of the dictionaries, in addition to having written out pronunciations, you can click and hear the pronunciation. And this, can, I think, can be especially helpful if you're preparing to give an oral presentation at an international conference. Also, um, I have a link to a um, favorite handout on um, punctuation. I like this because it's short, but gets to really the basics of English language punctuation. Another favorite um, resource is called Academic Phrase Bank. And this is neat because it has words or phrases that can work in different parts of a scientific paper. So let's say you have an unexpected finding and you're not sure what might be a good way to say that. Um, you can click on discussing findings and there's a section that says several ways that you could um, talk about or mention a, an unexpected finding. So I really like, like this as well. Another resource that I think um, has, um, is helpful, there is a website some of you may be familiar with called Author Aid, which is intended to help researchers in developing countries and elsewhere to write about and publish their work. And they have um, a blog with news. They um, have um, a manuscript checker to sort of check completeness. Um, from time to time, they have um, courses. And in fact, here's an announcement. You can sign up for their open online course that is starting next month. And one thing that I think is very helpful is it has a resource library with lots of presentations and articles and other resources on aspects of uh, scientific writing and presentation. And one thing I like is that the resource library, it's mainly in English, but it has um, also some resources in other languages, including several in Portuguese. I think um, Jose um, prepared some of them and other people prepared others. And so may want to check out both the English and Portuguese. And if you also, um, if you have um, Spanish, let's say as a second language, there is a Spanish version of the website and has many materials published in Spanish. Some further um, resources, um, I wrote an article titled Editing and Proofreading Your Work. And I this um, appeared in the American Medical Writers Association Journal and is available online. And so I have a link to that. 
Also, every summer I give um, an intensive course in research writing where um, basically people um, write or revise or revise and revise, re-revise a scientific paper section by section. And, um, and um, this is um, online from Texas University. A&M University, where I teach, I give this course, and it's online this summer, so it should be, um, I hope, relatively easy for people from various places to take it. And another resource that Josa asked me to mention is the um, book, How to Write and um, publish a scientific paper. It's now in its eighth edition. Um, my co-author, um, Robert Day, he, he wrote the first five editions and then had me join him for the recent editions because he is now long retired. In fact, he recently had what was, yes, his 97th birthday party by Zoom. And so I joined him for his 97th birthday party. And this book, it's available in print and as an ebook. I'm not sure whether your library has it. I hope, hope your library has it. And one thing, right now, I am working on the next edition. And if you have any suggestions, please feel free to share them with me because I always want to make the um the um, book, book as helpful as I can. Oh, I, I saw a um, typo in the um, in this. I am going to this typo. And um, this was sort of a merger of two of my email addresses. There shouldn't have been that, that J there. And it should just be begin. And I will send a corrected um, version of um, of this um, for for dist distribution. But the, hope this book is useful. It includes material on how to write the different parts of a scientific paper and how to publish it. But it also the book also includes chapters on other aspects of scientific communication, such as how to write grant proposals and how to give oral presentations and poster presentations. And so I think we've managed to time it about right. I've been using my handy kitchen timer here. And according to this, it's just under 60 minutes. And so I think we have some time for questions. And so let me open this up for questions and answers. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gistel, for uh, this such a such great presentation and to bring uh, and to mention to address so uh, important point about editing and and uh, writing, um, especially for uh, native speakers, no native speak, no native speakers, and for of course for everyone else who can. Um, can join. I, I would just, um, I just have some comments here in the uh, in the chat. Alini Pacifico, uh, she just said that it's that's a fantastic use for in practical seminar. Thank you so much. The English language is strictly easier in terms of preventing us from being prolix, but the Portuguese language, due to its complexity contributes to say things in a plenty of ways. Then as our Q3 does help, uh, we ended up talking, writing a lot without saying anything. <laughs> this training is very important and we would be need uh, since from that, we need uh, this kind of training since uh, from Presco. So she just- uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for these comments. Uh, very interesting comment. So I think we have time for like uh, one or like 
two questions. Someone, uh, Alexandre Gianazzi, uh, Gianchini, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correct, uh, say that I have a question about acronyms. Is there a minimal number of citations of a group of words to start in use an acronym? Right, that is a great question. So um, if you're going to use a term, how many times would you need to use it to make it worthwhile to use an acronym? And there's no strict rule, but a general guideline is it should be used at least three times because if you're using it, you know, fewer than three times, you're really not saving much space and just maybe confusing people. So, you know, if something's used maybe at least three or five times, it may be useful to have an acronym, particularly if a standard acronym exists. But Probably, let's say, if you're wanting to make up an acronym yourself, probably then you'd only do it if, let's say, something's used 20 times or something. But, but um, you, usually the thought is, you know, certainly at, le at least three. And also sometimes a um, question might be how close together they, they are being used. Because, for example, if it's close together, then people remember the acronym. But let's say if something's going to be used once in the introduction, once in the methods, and once in the discussion, people may not remember the acronym, and it might be better to write it out in full. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gay. So uh, I have a question um, um, that something that I, I'm, I've been observing um, uh, lately. And can you just talk about uh, the current tendency of people heavy, heavily and in some case solidly uh, rely on thematic tools for editing and writing, such as Grammarly or Trinka, which is, a based, which is based on artificial intelligence? and many others we have out there. And I understand that they are useful tools, but um, what do you think that people uh, should do not to rely only on these tools as a mean of, as a mean of saving time and improving writing and editing? Right. I think these are good tools, but they are only tools. They don't totally... Um, uh, um, replace human judgment. And because I know sometimes the suggestions aren't appropriate. I don't remember the exact one, but someone asked me, there was something where Grammarly suggested a rewording, but the rewording made it so it wasn't the standard wording in the field. And so I think it's good to, um, it's sometimes helpful to use something like Grammarly or Trinka as a starting point to and But then, rather than automatically accepting things, look at each suggested change and use your own judgment and say, oh, yes, that really is an improvement, or no, nobody in this field would word it this way. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay, we have... I, I, we're going to take one uh, more question from uh, Professor Isis Jalmeida. Uh, she's a professor here at uh, our uh, hospital. She teaches scientific writing and she say, uh, she, she's saying that she enjoyed the, the presentation and, and she's involved in giving lectures on scientific writing in editing papers, papers here at the hospital. And she's curious uh, to know if at uh, American universities or your university, if there are uh, courses for undergraduate students on writing and, and in her experience, uh, um, Good writing is a skill that has to be start soon and early. Right, good. Well, first of all, let me say good to meet you. It's always good to meet, meet another colleague in this field. And I'd say in the United States, some universities have undergraduate courses in scientific writing. Probably most don't, but some do. I'm pleased to say at our university, we do have some such courses, but probably not enough to serve all our, our um, students. I think our university has a very good policy. Our university requires all each undergraduate student to take two writing intensive courses in his or her major. And so, for example, 
In my um, part of the university, there are undergraduate biomedical sciences majors. And as one of their writing and talk intensive courses, most of them do take a course that's sort of an introduction to scientific writing. And I, I, I agree that, um, that writing isn't something you develop overnight or something that a skill that you suddenly get when you're a PhD student or a postdoctoral fellow, that it is, it is great to, um, to start early. And so thank you yeah. for the question. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gates. I agree. Uh, but one thing that it's important also to mention that in United in the United States we have like uh, writing centers available for uh, students, and this is something that we here in Brazil there's just few, and this is one thing that is really important, and I should it should be uh, spread over the world. I think. I, I am glad that you mentioned writing centers because in my list of resources, I am, I was going to um, also, I was debating also mentioning writing centers. And I think I'm going to send you a revised list of slides for distribution that is going to add um, two things. One is writing centers because a lot of writing centers in the United States have websites. And so even if people from other countries, for example, can't go to the writing centers and have, you know, at US writing centers and have people look at their writing, most of them at websites have lots of openly accessible resources. So I will send you a slide with listing a couple of examples of writing centers. Also, as I was going through um, the um, slides, as I was giving the presentation, I, I realized that probably another um, resource I should have listed is the AMA Manual of Style from the American Medical Association. And that, particularly if you're publishing internationally in medicine, is I think largely the standard. So I'm going to add a slide about that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gay. So uh, just a comment here about uh, Dr. Easy uh, is that she's saying that there is no writing centers here in Brazil, but there is Dr. Easy. I, I'm part of the a writing center here in Brazil uh, that is run by the University of Sao Paulo. And we can talk about that uh, uh, a little further if you want. And um, some people are just thank you here, Susana Gontijo, uh, just saying thank you for the lecture and very objective and she's saying that Brazilian authors must practice more Anglo-Saxon straightforward way of writing and it's very interesting. Um, do, do, Dr. Gister, I think we are coming to the end of the session and do you would like to add anything before we close to the section? Close well, the section, I'm, sorry. Well, I just want to Thank you. I'm closing with a picture. This is part of the university where I now work. I think um, this building was probably, and this part of the university was built since Joseph was, um, was here. I don't know if you've seen this part, but you'll have to come visit me when conditions allow um, in this part. I hope, hope many of you can visit my university, but I'm so glad that I was able to um, visit um, with you um, today by by Zoom. Hope this um, lecture was helpful, and I wish you all the best. And again, I, I I hope we'll be able to talk again. So take care. Oh, thank you, Dr. Crucio, and just say thank you, everyone here again. Um, and I, I just uh, would like to to thank you, Marcia Soledad, Marcos Aurelio de Sandes, João Paulo Pereira, and all the professionals that uh, were involved in the production of these webinars and for the time for the time and hard work. And once again, thank you, Dr. Gaystil, and thank you all for watching and listening. And see you in the upcoming sessions. Yes, well, thank you for being thank the you. moderator and my thanks to all who made this possible. <laughs> thanks, bye.